this week, James Wilkinson, don't mention, oh, I'm not supposed to mention that, sorry. James Wilkinson's going to join us. It's going to be awesome. We're going to talk about making the transition from the military into enterprise security. Um, in the news, Guardicore has some new announcements on micro-segmentation. Sumo Logic is supporting some new technology. Cloud Passage is in the news doing some stuff with containers. And three, I think, pretty big, uh, all three are pretty big acquisitions. Uh, McAfee, Trend Micro, and another firm, which isn't listed there, have made acquisitions in the security space. And I want to talk about how that impacts you as an enterprise security defender. All that and more on this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Was uh, ha, The teleprompter now has artificial intelligence, Doug, and updates itself. It's awesome. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, this week and talk about them as it relates to enterprise security. You're going to do great. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> I, I think that people think that you and I talk like every day at night. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, what are you doing? It's kind of a bit of an exhausting week. And I think that we noticed that a little bit in the uh, stories for this week as well. Logarithms Netmon Freemium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. Netmon Freemium is a free commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use Netmon Freemium's powerful capabilities to search against all observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. Welcome everyone to episode 70 of Enterprise Security Weekly. 71. For November 29th, 2017, and I'm your host, Doug White. Oh, wait, that was last week. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Very excited to be here. And you missed it. All three screens had the Raspberry Pi logo on them just earlier, and which makes you think we might have three Raspberry Pis, but it's really just one. It's magic. It's magic. And, and they got it working just in time for the show, which is awesome. A lot of technology behind this new fancy set that we have here in G-Unit Studios I want to uh, first bring on our illustrious co-host for today, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo, the sand hobo himself. Welcome, Michael. It's uh, it's. I probably feel like it's been forever. You know, we tell people we don't talk every day. Uh, you and John have the the bromance thing going. You and I apparently just do shows every day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this is I. I'm gonna feel bad if I don't get on the show tomorrow because uh, I know, it'll be I a day without Paul. I don't it's know like what a day happened. without sunshine. Oh, you can come on Paul Security Weekly tomorrow. I mean, we're doing a show. It's going to be fun. Um, so <laughs> I don't know where John is this week. I forgot. And I called him and it went right to voicemail, which makes me think he's usually teaching because he usually doesn't answer his phone while he's teaching. Uh, so it makes me think he's he's teaching uh, or on vacation. I don't think he's on vacation, though. I think he's definitely teaching somewhere. So John will not be here with us uh, today, which I had to talk to him. John, if you're watching, call me. Call me, please. Um, <laughs> how about that for sending a message? Um, before we, well, before we get into announcements, I, I will say that I did upgrade my Mac to high Sierra, uh, today. Does anyone know what the root password is after you update? Anyone? A- anyone? Fixed. Uh, the, um, the update servers were really, really fast today as well. That's like my stand up bit about the new Apple <laughs> vulnerability. I, it's kind of lame, but I made those jokes on Twitter and it got a lot of attention today, which is pretty funny. <laughs> Well, there you go. I, I think I think people are freaking out. I don't think it's a huge deal. In my testing, you couldn't go on the command line and do like su space minus and get root without a password. At least in my testing, I don't know if people have different mileage. There is a really great post that we're going to be talking about on Paul Security Weekly uh, this week tomorrow. Tomorrow, in fact, that goes into all the technical details as to why and how like all of that happens in the new uh, vulnerability. It kind of also for the enterprise crowd makes me 
Uh, not surprised why more enterprises aren't managing or trying to manage OS 10 in the environment and use Active Directory given its significant limitations on security, insecurity by design. In Active Directory, it still allows for uh, management. So kind of interesting. I don't know, Michael, if you have 30 seconds on that. Yeah, I mean, look, the way that I look at a lot of these things now is, oh, that's interesting. Let me read into it. And what I'm finding is a lot of the new most devastating, this is the worst ever, or, oh, by the way, they have to have physical access to your device. Now, uh, I appreciate there's yeah. a lot of places where that happens. I, I'm not I'm not diminishing it so much, but if you showed me something that could be exploited remotely that gave you root access uh, and then could be somehow automated, that's that's not good. Right. But the, so, hey, let me show you this trick. And then I was kind of alarmed that the solution was, by the way, go change your root password. And I, I, you you actually put this out, but it was it was a bug crowd. Uh, Keith uh, Hoodlet Keith had Hoodlet. A, a really good article, kind of broke it down. And he said, you know, by the way, here's the best thing. Don't do it. Yeah, don't play with don't it. Just don't do it. Don't touch it. Let it go. Um, I was kind of surprised because it seems like nobody warned Apple. They just dropped it publicly. Mm -hmm. And then within, what, 18 hours, Apple had a patch for it patch mm. by the way didn't require a reboot and uh, maybe the servers were light but it was a really quick download and install so it's kind of like one of those wow we needed something to hype it up. like guys we just had thanksgiving here in the u.s it's we're, we're coming into the crush of the year chill like relax i but i, I also know. from an, an enterprise perspective when you choose software from a particular vendor i think that apple not having a bug bounty program on mac os I think that's an issue. It's an issue for me. They have it on iOS. They well, don't on, have though. it they on macOS. Okay. See, so I didn't. I didn't realize that. I thought. I thought yeah. that it was really tightly constrained, as in you, it's invite only. You've got to be vetted and, and whatever else. Oh, so maybe there is an invite only. Uh, there maybe there is no public bug one. Maybe you're. Maybe you're right. Well, whoever they invited, obviously. Didn't find Somebody this issue, it. but that yeah, but that's yeah. yeah you know, I'm and, not and knocking it, the people uh, who are in the the invite only bug bounty either. Um, so. Because this isn't a huge issue either. It, you know, it's it's one of those things that, it, and it's like you and I, uh, we were chatting about before we came on air. You know, so is is it the, is it a problem that there's that the root password's null, or is the problem that there was like a pointer to it that somehow you know essentially gave you root access? And uh, yeah, look, some, somebody somewhere checked in a piece of code, and uh, they probably got whacked pretty hard in the head yesterday. But, you know, we always like to point out how quick people's responses are. So this got dropped publicly yesterday, and really, under 24 hours, there's already a patch for it? I, that strikes me as good, Paul. No? Yeah. No, it's good. It's good. You know what else is good? Training from ITPro.tv. Make sure you go to ITPro.tv yes, forward slash enterprise security. Get their supervisor portal. It's awesome. If you work in an enterprise today, you should be encouraging your organization to subscribe to a, uh, a program. For many of your employees, you get to choose how many, and they get access to all of the wonderful training. Not only are they in-depth security training, there's virtualization, there's cloud and containers and project management. It's a great source so that everyone in your organization is always learning and always has a great, reliable resource to go to when they want to learn something. Um, kind of rounds out my strategy, right? Like, I think SANS training is very important. Uh, to immerse yourself for that time. I think uh, degree programs, if you're uh, you know, going to a degree program, I think there's a place for that. So you'll see in 2018, I'm strategically trying to play some content within our network to talk about uh, our recommendations and our thoughts and opinions on uh, security training and education. So look more for that coming next year. All righty. Well, let's introduce our special guest for today, James Wilkinson, who's currently uh, a VP of Information Security somewhere, uh, retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel and transformative IT leader. James, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. How are you today? I am doing fantastic. Because uh, I said a root password today, I'm doing great. Um, so, <laughs> James... <laughs> How did you, uh, I'll start with the kind of Paul Security Weekly question, because I think it really segues nicely into our discussion today. How did you get started in information security and then work to where you are today uh, in your career? Okay, great. Uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Paul, for that. So basically, uh, I'm a bit of a hybrid, if you will. So uh, I start my career in the Marine Corps, believe it or not. So I spent about 14 and a half years in my Marine, in, uh, of my military career in the Marine Corps. 
And then I did an inner service transfer, transferred to the Army and continued. Hmm. But I came into the Marine Corps as a, what we used to call a data systems officer, and now they call it an information systems officer. So we started back then when we had Banyan Vines, if you can remember back that far. Oh, uh, uh, sort of. As like Banyan late, Vines, like late 90s. Yeah, like before uh, a win and T came in. So yep, yep. that's basically uh, where I started as a, a information system officer in the Marine Corps. So uh, that's how my career started. And security has always been uh, a top of mind for us in the military. Uh, uh, and it's also morphed into more privacy conversations and more data security private conversations. So that's basically where I got my start um, back in the day. And then you've made the transition from uh, the military into the private sector, correct? Correct. I have. Yes, I have. So I, I, just talk about at a high level, like where, where you went after the, the Army. Okay. So after I retired out of the Army, uh, it took a while to uh, look for the right fit and the right role. Uh, you can't just come out and just take anything. That's how I looked at it. And so it took a while. I ended up landing at uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, that's where I work, and it's a, a great opportunity, great organization. And in enterprise information security on the corporate side, you have to be able to depict where you want to be. And it and it's based on different companies, large companies, medium-sized companies, and small companies. So coming from the military where you kind of have to do it all, if you're a CIO or a, or a CISO, what we would call them, or CTO, you have responsibility for security as well as the, the network and day-to-day -day operations. Where here in the corporate side, you kind of have to pick, do you want to be a CIO over applications and hardware or hardware, or do you want to be on the security side? So that hopefully gives a, a little bit of perspective of how I had to look at where did I want to be once I transitioned out of the military. See, that that's interesting, James. I always thought of it as backwards. I always thought if you were... Uh, had a post in, in the military and you were doing some kind of information technology or security that because it's such a large organization and, and multiple sub-organizations that you had a more specific role. But what you're saying is, at least in your experience, that you were kind of jack of all trades when, when you were in the military. That is correct. A lot of us are a jack of all trades. Uh, a lot of us end up specializing. We do have different branches, for example, in the Army where you would specialize as to be in a network, uh, more of a network engineer, security officer, or you could be an information security uh, information security officer. So for us, we had two different tracks uh, in the Army side. Uh, please forgive me. That's okay. And so what we want to do is, um, give me one second. Sorry about that. So, That's okay. Did you need to get that, James? We, it's cool. No, I'm just, I'm no, just no, bummed. <laughs> oh, they so really want to talk to you. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I, I turned off all my phones except the house phone. And, uh, it, it, that, that's not good. Uh, so, no sorry about that. No worries. So, uh, I was, uh, what was I talking about? Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, so you end up coming in. I say I started up as a network administrator. <clears throat> Uh, managing networks as as a, as an officer, and you have people that focus on uh, servers, building servers. You got uh, teams that actually do satellite communications or your transport, and then and then you're you're there in the middle, and then you have your your, your we call it comsec. Uh, so your uh, your your cryptography, crypt, your crypto mm -hmm. that's used for your uh, encryption devices. So we had all that, but you had to be exposed to all of that, and so. As you grow and progress, you end up going into more project program management uh, roles. You're not as hands-on typically, uh, but you still have your finger on the pulse. You still have to go through lots of trainings uh, just to stay current and to be able to uh, actually assume certain jobs. You have to have certain qualifications to be able to do that. Is that is is that one of the the major differences? Was the kind of the structuring and career planning? How is that different in the military versus uh, in the enterprise? Oh, my goodness. Career planning and structuring. So, okay, so I have a limited view from the corporate side, but I will tell you that coming to the corporate side, you need to have a mentor. And you need to have someone that can show you this is how company X runs. And so I have friends in other roles in other companies, and they say you're kind of like on your own. So trying to find First of all, finding out about how the company's culture is, 
and how the company works? And then how do you maneuver inside the company to achieve that role that you think you want to be or, or, or have? The, the converse to that, being in the military, a lot of things are kind of laid out for you. There's already a known structure. When you take this particular job, for example, you come in as a, an operation security side or you're working in a network operation center. Uh, from there, then you have to go to another role where now you're not just working in the network operation center as an analyst or as a person ahead of special projects. Now you're actually the operations officer where you're running the network operation center. Now we would call those SOCs, your, your security operation centers. So the names have changed, but we've done them. Uh, but the names have changed, so we've had to change as well to adapt to some of the names. And that's kind of how I've seen it. And then from an operations role, then you go do something that's more of a, what we call a broadening career uh, assignment where you move out of that particular space and you go somewhere you stretch a little bit. So you might end up going to recruiting and learn about sales and learn how to sell and learn how to uh, befriend people and, and advocate for a particular product or service you're selling, which is the military. Or you might end up going to an industry fellowship like I end up doing. Uh, the Army sent me to uh, Microsoft on an industry fellowship, and I learned something different of how Microsoft runs some of the areas that I worked in, how they function. And so that was a stretch tour. Then you come back into your career space, and then you begin taking more senior-level roles, which have more broad perspective and more greater responsibility. Did I ask your question? <laughs> yes. Um, so in the military, what are some of the skills, some of the top skills that, in your opinion, James, that you were able to develop that you could directly apply to uh, information security positions in the enterprise? Okay, that's a great question. So uh, a lot of people I talk to, they think, you know, hey, we hire military because they uh, they come to work on time. They're, they're really great. Hey, we're drug free. We're police free. You know, all those uh, uh, things that they that you normally would hear. But I, I, I like to, to tell you that we, we actually have some other intangible skills that some people may not even think about. So, for example, number one, education. A lot of us end up going to schools, uh, higher education, um, uh, private those private institutions that are highly regarded. We also have uh, a lot of technical expertise and we have a lot of people that are deep in Linux or deep in whatever OS you're talking about. Some are very deep in the, uh, uh, the communication spectrum. So satellite communications or where they're dealing in UHF, VHF or HF, uh, MRSAT. So we have uh, people that are deep in a lot of different areas. One of the other intangibles I would say is our ability to be able to matrix or merge in multiple environments, meaning we have a geopolitical aspect about us because if we're in another country, you can't just go do whatever you want to do because you represent the United States and you represent your service and you can't have an international incident. We, we also uh, have a good sense of the big picture. A lot of us end up working in organizations that have a sense of why are we here? What are we doing? And you have this sense of purpose. And so that gives us the innate ability to be able to solve problems quickly because oh, or the same outcome. Sorry, your internet was just gotten a little in and out there. Oh, oh that, there's nothing we can okay. do about that, but you want me to repeat that? No, it, we, we got everything you're saying. I just don't want our audience to think that you are like stuttering or, or pausing for a really <laughs> long time. It was the, the internet connection. So, uh, Michael, okay, do you have great. questions uh, for James or comments on, on what we've talked about so far? Well, I've, I've been really kind of enjoying the experience. Here's a question I do have, though. And I, I know it might not be a popular question, but uh, and, and of course, thank you for your service. But you, you've retired at... at what oh five right so you're uh, yeah so uh, uh, all right so lieutenant colonel so you're officer track um, you had some pretty cool clearances which meant you know you went through a gauntlet is are is uh, some of the stuff that you're talking about uh, available only to officers or is it anybody in the military like do you draw a distinction and, and I know I I, I have a, a family background in the military so I understand that what I'm asking may rile some people but 
is there a distinction then between enlisted and officers? You, you see that there's a distinction between the branches beyond the, beyond the uh, the usual rabble rousing that happens between the branches. But like, is some of what you were able to do because of right your army? So wh- whatever your MOS was designated, or because you've worked in two branches, can you say no? Some of these traits are actually pretty transferable, uh, and we need to focus on those a little bit better. Okay, that's that's a great question. Uh, thanks for asking that question. So, basically, no, it is what every soldier, sailor, airman, marine, everyone in the military has these traits. So, I'll specifically target the the army because that's where I retired from. Those, it's not just limited to to officers in the experience. It's also our enlisted workforce as well. So, uh, our senior leaders, you know, E7s, E8s, master sergeants, and sergeant majors, they are some very dynamic and remarkable people that you probably would not even realize. But some of them have PhDs, some of them have master's degrees. A lot of them, uh, if they're in the technical field, they're really good in their space. And we also have chief warrant officers who became a, who were enlisted first and became a a chief warrant officer, those are some highly skilled people and individuals. So I would say there's there's no difference um, in the officer enlisted and chief warrant officer when it comes to those intangibles, because we all are a part of a team, especially when we're on whatever mission or objective we're trying to accomplish. Uh, some of the education tracks may be different uh, in some of the uh, eligibility to be able to do some of those things, but we still send people on these industry fellowships to like NASCAR, to Coca-Cola, to Kansas City Chiefs, and uh, to cooking schools. And there are they're they're enlisted. They're not officers. And so there's some there's some uh, balance, a give and take there. If if that uh, answers your question. No, it does. You know what? You reminded me too. I've got a buddy who's an E8 who has a PhD. A plus a separate master's degree and is a partner uh, in a practice. And so it's kind of like, a, oh, yeah, that's that's a good point. So, I, no, I, I liked how you answered that. So I'm going to ask, I mean, do you miss the military? Uh, like now that you're on the corporate side of things, did you find it is the grass greener or is it just different? But your military heritage allowed you to adapt to it. I, I tell you what, uh, that is a great question. And is the grass green on the other side? I tell you what. The grass may look greener, but you know what? It still needs to be cut. Mm -hmm. So you still have to perform, perform, perform. You still have to prove yourself day in, day out, even on the corporate side. Um, I do miss the military. And one of the things I do miss about the military is, you know, I'm one of our esprit de corps and our sense of purpose. So observations uh, from myself and and other colleagues. Um, in the corporate side, the motivations may be different for what it is and why you're doing it. For example, you, you may be motivated by if you're in an organization that has a, a bonus structure or something, you're motivated by the bonus to really do well. Uh, or And you're also motivated to uh, shareholder uh, value, uh, to increase shareholder value if you are in an organization that is a public company, right, a publicly traded company. Where, whereas in the military, a lot of us are are bound by the, the the common bond amongst one another. So I'm not only being a professional for myself, but I'm also being a professional for that man or woman that's sitting or standing next to me, because I have a purpose to fulfill. I have a job to do for this particular effort or this mission. So we're mission focused, mission oriented, and it takes out any ambiguity yep. of pay or bonus or people's livelihoods because we deal in people's life not livelihoods so it does that answer your question no i I like it you know it's one of the things paul and i've been talking about a lot is that there's a there's a security industry and there's a security community And, and what i'm realizing listening to you is when you're in the military, there's a mission and if there's a mission there's a purpose and if you've got a good commander and the commander's intent's clear then people can rally behind that. And I think what we find a lot of times is that in the industry, there's confusion. And in the community, we have a tendency to not always support each other as well as I think we could. And I, and so maybe there's some opportunities. Now, do you see signs then where people are getting some of that right? And and, and you can bring over some of those lessons of, of mission focus and commander's intent. I mean, I appreciate that we're not necessarily talking always about life, and it, right, I think it's a good distinction, life versus livelihood. But do you see signs then where 
as a leader in the commercial side, you're able to offer some of those things? Or have you recognized it in other people? And are there things then that we should try to amplify and do more of? Yeah, I think I think one of the things I've observed in uh, and, and, and talking through my uh, other peers and colleagues is that a lot of the things we do in the military are very transferable and we all uh, have a sense of purpose. So even in the corporate sector, you know, whereas in the military, you know, you, you may you know not do something absolutely 100 percent correct. You probably may still have your job the next day unless you really, really do not necessarily be the case so there is a different uh can i say pucker factor on on the uh on the podcast oh, there's a different it. I love it. <laughs> there's a different pucker factor <laughs> in the corporate side because you could be gone the next day uh but the companies that get it want to keep their people and want to keep them engaged and focused because they really need them we have a shortage of security professionals on the whole information security spectrum whether you're Uh, A malware analysis, whether you're a pen tester, whether you're a network person, whether you're application security, network security, whether you're a transport security individual, you name it. There is we need people deep in each one of those areas, but we also need people that do governance. So uh, to to, I guess to kind of wrap up uh, your your question, uh, yes, I do see a difference in the corporate sector because it's. And if we don't get it right, a lot of people will not be will be out of work because the network's down and you can't do business and and you can't have that. James, one of the things um, that I was thinking of in the context of this conversation was the way in which you acquire various tools and or products is very different in the military than it is in the private sector. Can you kind of talk about those differences and how you made that transition? Yeah, so a lot of the skills and the intangibles, if you will, that we gain in the military is inherent to us. For example, you would go to a new job or what have you. You would know there are standard operating procedures. You would know you would expect someone to bring you on board to kind of do what a left seat, right seat ride, show you how things work, show you about the culture. This is how you maneuver in this space. And, and then they would leave and then it's your show. You got it. So you have that onboarding, as we call it in the corporate sector, you have that onboarding that really helps you focus on that. Um, the, the military does a great job of that. Those skills will be transferred to the corporate sector. As you get there, you will draw on all these experiences. So I'll give you an example uh, for some of the uh, corporate leaders. When's the last time you hired somebody on your team that actually has sat and talked with an ambassador or an economic advisor or a station chief about some objectives you want to achieve in country X. You probably haven't because you don't even know that just military person has a geopolitical experience that the, the person you're hiring from XYZ company or school, they don't have that experience. They don't have that exposure. So you have this worldview and exposure and experience of how to talk to people, how to might possibly negotiate and not offend others, but you're able to bring that into the workforce. Now, one of the things I have observed that doesn't work well is our, our directness in driving results, if you will. So sometimes we are pretty direct in our conversation and say, hey, why does this screw it up? Somebody, hey, we need to fix it. Just, just fix it. That may not work very well in mm-hmm. some corporate areas because they're more uh, passive aggressive or you can't be as directive Because it's a collective coming together to solve problems. It's not just you, the senior person, directing someone to do something. Does that help answer your question there? Did did I I hit on a point? You know what? Yeah, and and I want to push on that because that's an area I I spent a lot of time with. And I really like that distinction. But you said said a second point to that, so I want to tease it out for people. There's a directness, and and I, 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 I will always favor directness over passive aggressiveness. But then there's also a... But the hierarchical structure has shifted. So it's no longer, I'm the senior officer, okay, I've made a decision, let's go. It's the, I'm the senior officer, and so are the five other people around here. Oh, and that person in the corner can screw the whole thing up. I still think people like the directness. They're maybe not used to the bluntness. A lot of people have gotten by without being called on their BS. And when they get <laughs> called on it, they they're, they don't know what to do with it. But I would just separate those two out. Yes, people are not necessarily used to it, but, but I find more people like it than not. 
not the person who's under fire, of course. But then the second part's interesting. It's that structure. So how has that transition been for you? Um, you you're not, I mean, you know, you, you'll still command the respect as, a, as an 05 for those who understand it. But a lot of people are like, yeah, military, cool, great. Welcome to the commercial sector, my friend. How, how has that transition been for you? Uh, that transition has been a, a challenging one, uh, but it's been a good challenge. And here's why. Because I find myself spending time translating my military experience. And a lot of people don't necessarily understand that. So I find myself being like an ambassador for 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 military uh, individuals who spent time, who get and who understands it. So if you're talking about a, a, a strategic strategy or strategy, you're sitting there like, oh, that's a campaign plan that's an operational plan that we need to we need to flush out but in translation the terms are slightly different but the functions are the same so for us it's a matter of learning the language of the corporate side so that we can better fit into the corporate culture because we already have a lot of these skills that are required uh, to be able to be successful and to help transform and change organizations. But sometimes you need to understand how the organization functions, how it works, and then you'll be able to implement a lot of your innovation and and draw on a lot of your experience to be able to help drive change in an organization. So if you're always consistent, you're always early, you're always on time, uh, you always have a meeting, but you have an agenda for the meeting instead of just calling a meeting, those things will become transferable. It's just second nature. And then you, you'll call people and say, hey, what, what are we meeting for? You got a meeting, but uh, there's no agenda. So what are we doing? That type of thing. I know it's a small example, but that's some of the things you would expect when you're already coming from an environment that that's already a norm. No, I like it. But then does the the rotation billets and, and the way that the military forms its teams around the mission – and then over time reforms the teams. Did it give you the ability then? Do you ha- do you have more comfort? Do you find your your colleagues from the military service when when they come into the commercial sector? Do you feel more comfortable in some of those chaotic environments and realizing, okay, I got to get a read. I got to understand the tempo and the language and the cadence of this organization so I can find my place and 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 be successful. Does that give you a leg up? I think it does because, you know, remember the military was one of the first organizations to actually integrate, you know. Um, So and so when you're talking about I have no problems working for a senior leader who is a woman, Uh, I have no problems uh, working for a senior leader who may be of a different country um, or, or nationality of a different country because we have a same purpose, the same origin uh, and to accomplish the same thing. We're all on the same team. So I think by coming from the military, you have that level of sensitivity. You also have that level of respect for the person. And your whole function is to accomplish the job, whatever it is. And so I think those are the, some of the binding elements that, that bring us together. And that allow me to be able to transition in the corporate space, because sometimes you're in an environment where there's very A type personalities, like in special operations or special forces, A type personalities all day. And you will get lost in the sauce if you are not one of them. But then you can go to <laughs> another environment that is very laid back, and then you can go be a C type personality, and it's the group think thing. And you're just like, okay, yeah, sure. So you have to be a chameleon because not only are you in the army, but I'm in joint operations at one moment, and now I'm in another country, and now I have to adjust my conversation or my tone when we're trying to solve for problems or solutions. So you you get all of that just by over time and by being in the military and then you come out and transition, now you get to leverage all of those skills and draw on them. Uh, one of the things I think companies hire are performers and, and, and the person. So the performers are the ones who actually have a good track record of being successful. And then the person is, is are you a good fit? That's when you're in the interview and they're trying to figure out if you're a good fit for their culture. One of the things I've looked at a lot of people will tell us, oh, there's a shortage of people in the cybersecurity industry. I'm, I'm pretty vocal and pretty consistent. And I don't see the shortage. 
But everything I've heard from you suggests to me that people who feel there's a shortage should probably be looking at a veteran uh, or somebody transitioning out of the military <laughs> and talking to them about how it could work. What do you think somebody who's in that situation should know uh, th- that they should ask, especially if, if somebody may not necessarily ha- had uh, a cyber training in the military, but the the traits you've discussed, I think, make people wildly successful in our, our career, our profession, whatever we want to call it. What advice would you give to a hiring manager uh, and or HR to, to think differently about how they can fill their needs locally with people that have served our country or their respective countries and have some of these experiences? How can they think differently about it? Oh, that's a great question. How do they think differently about it? I, um, I have a couple of great uh, points for that one for you. So one of the reasons I think they can think differently about hiring a veteran is because they may not really understand who they are hiring. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the military has about 200,000 people that transition out of the military every year. So let's be more specific. The Army has probably about 70,000 people that transition out of the military every year. 70,000. That's a lot of people, right? Different career fields, different uh, what have you. But we all have these intangible skills, whether you're enlisted or officer, to be able to come in. And uh, we learn well. We're quick learners. We have the ability to learn and just you know, teach them. So something that some employers may not be aware of is that the average person that transitions out of the military – stays on that job for they transition jobs two to three times in one to two years so you might say that's a lot of transition well because we're trying to find our fit and sometimes it's not a good fit but you won't know that until you join the organization so it's not like there's some magic wand we can uh, perform and say all right it's the company i want to work for and everything's perfect you have to get inside first to see if that fits for you And then the type of individuals that you are hiring, 1% of the population joins the military. But I'll be more specific uh, in this example, say for uh, military officers. And to be more specific, information systems or information security officers in the military, right now there's probably, I don't know, about say 700 in my particular career field. So IT officers in the Army is probably about a population of about 700 out of 98,000 officers there's 700 of them that are IT professionals right and then there's probably a little bit more cuz they're broken out but this for this particular career field the 26 career field and inside of that you got captains majors lieutenant colonels and colonels well you're look only looking at about 6% of that population are there and then the higher up the rank they go, they're even more specialized or more specific. So the individual you're hiring is probably like the one or two percent that is really good and really on top of their game. And they're well equipped to lead, manage people, processes, budgets, technologies. And so it's just a matter of the total person that they probably need to understand who they're getting. That's uh, one of the characteristics I, I would think. Um, another example, I had a conversation with one recruiter. I, re- I never forget it. I said, <laughs> you know, you should you should hire a, a, a network engineer from the Army. I'm like, well, why not? And she said, well, no, I would hire a network engineer from uh, who under who uh, a, a, a SAP HANA network engineer. I said, a what? SAP HANA? You mean SAP 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 HANA? I said, that's like an application. I said, but if you hire a network engineer from the Army, we take a blank sheet of paper and we start drawing out the network, the security, the protocols, procedures. They'll take a blank sheet of paper and do that. And you want to hire somebody that's good and understand the application. Now, if that's what you're looking for, then state that. But don't tell me that there's a difference and you'll hire this person over this person because I would tell you the person that's the network engineer on the military side is probably hands down the best, the most valuable player you can have on your team. And you that's know, my bo- it, It's so funny you say that, James, because actually I just uh, interviewed <clears throat> recently the director of the research labs for Onapsis um, that does SAP and Oracle uh, security uh, products. And he said, I, I really didn't have much experience with, with SAP or, or Oracle, but Onapsis hired me because of my you know, experience and because of the person. And, you know, his team has gone on under his leadership to uncover 
uh, over a hundred, I want to say, vulnerabilities uh, in those products and responsibly disclose all of them. So just to back up your story with specific to that technology, which is kind of funny. Uh, I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's great. Hey, thank you. James, thank you so much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly. Love the conversation. Thank you for taking the time uh, to do the interview. Hey, thanks for having me. i uh, love to come back anytime. I appreciate it. You all have a great day. Thank you. You too, James. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back, talk about the enterprise security news for this week. And it's, it's going to be provocative. That's all I'm going to say. Stay tuned. <laughs> 